Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, although I'm not here with you, but you know, virtual as everything is done these days and um, very glad that we could do this. You guys look very comfortable out there. I'm glad for that. I'm good too. So uh, let me give you a brief, a brief background. I was born in Baltimore, but I grew up here in the Los Angeles area and music was always a part of my family. Uh, my dad and my mom appreciated music and they would play different things on the recording, the radio, etc. I'd hear jazz, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, I'd hear classical, bolero, Tchaikovsky, 1812, whatever. Uh, so there was always music in the house and my mom played piano. Uh, I took a few piano lessons way back when and I enjoyed it and I think it's very useful. It's always been great for I would say almost any musician to be able to play piano. But anyway, I grew up loving music and particularly drums, as I think you all know with rhythm. When you hear something, you pick out a rhythm that you hear. I did that as a kid also and was just attracted to drums. And I started studying uh, through beginning band in junior high school. Uh, and played junior high, high school, and the marching band, etc. But didn't really get a, a lesson, private lesson, until I got to college at uh, Cal State University Los Angeles, where Mitchell Peters taught at the time. I hope you know that name. He's got many books out, and I'm sure. So, any, if you, any hands up, anyone use any Mitchell Peters books? Okay, <laughs> there's a few. <laughs> Great. Uh, so. Uh, High school, like I said, I played in the band, the orchestra, et cetera, and I really had this affinity for symphonic music, and um, the band director at Cal State LA came and did an all-city band, and I played in that. He was very impressed with my playing, offered me a scholarship to Cal State LA, which I did, and like I said, I studied with Mitchell Peters there, the best thing for me. We had a great relationship hit it off we just understood each other and i make a long story short i played in some youth orchestras at the same time the american youth symphony which was conducted by zubin Mehta's father meili Mehta, uh the young musicians foundation debut orchestra here in, here in la uh, for which many conductors came went on to have great careers including michael tilson thomas if you've heard of michael um, but anyway, after I finished Cal State LA, there was an opening in the LA Phil. And my teacher, Mitchell Peters, who was co-principal there with Bill Kraft, uh, said, you should do the audition. I said, no way. This will be my first professional audition. I'm not ready. He said, you're ready. Uh, so I did it. And to my surprise, I was offered the job of co-principal along with my teacher, Mitchell Peters. And uh, I played in the LA Phil for 33 years as first co-principal and then principal percussion and timpani. Uh, my dream job, what I love to do, I love classical music and to do that was pretty amazing with the fantastic conductors, soloists and my colleagues in the orchestra. I've been retired now five years and enjoying doing a different thing with music, more administrative. I've started a uh, an alliance that has helped mentoring young black orchestra percussionists too. So, so along the way, you know, I've done a lot of other things and I've taught at University of California, UCLA, USC, my alma mater, uh, Cal State LA. I've played in several soundtracks here in LA. Um, the, the latest probably would be the latest version of The Lion King. That was fun to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't want this to be a lecture where I'm talking, talking, so let me stop here and ask if there's any questions at this point. So what's your favorite genre of play? Oh, well, I'd say without a doubt classical. Uh, that's been my focus pretty much, but I must say I do appreciate and I do play others too. Um, Years ago, I started studying West African drumming, and I, it's just it's just stuck with me. I just love doing that. It's so different from classical. With the West African drumming, you obviously do not use music. 
and it's not as structured. It's a more of a free form. I mean, there is structure to it, but it's just not a written, written, uh, written down music type thing. And uh, it's the djembe orchestra. I'm sure you've all heard of the djembe drum, the dununs, et cetera, et cetera, which is known throughout the Malinke Empire of the West African. And it's, it, I recommend that you do something different from what your what your focus is. It gives you good balance, and it's it's a good good thing to do. I saw another hand up. Yes. What's your, what's your favorite classical piece of music? Favorite classical music was that the question? Peace. Oh, peace. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry that the sound cuts you off sometimes, so. I don't hear the whole sentence, but if it's the favorite classical music piece, is that right? Uh, without a doubt, without a doubt, the Rite of Spring. And talking to a lot of other percussionists, it's the same for them. I remember when I first heard it, I was just blown away by the rhythm, the use of timpani and percussion throughout the entire piece. It just, it drew me into classical music without a doubt. Um, Hands up, any know the Rite of Spring? Have heard it, know it, familiar with that piece? Wow, okay, you guys have got, <laughs> you've got to listen to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's, a fa it's over 100 years old now. It's 100 and, what, 109 years old, but still an amazing piece that really put a stamp on the 20th century. Everything changed after that. Uh, another question? <laughs> so do you have a specific instrument you like to play the most yeah and <laughs> the easy answer is it's whatever i'm playing that week with the orchestra would be it would have been my favorite i mean that's to me is a joy of percussion we get such a variety we get to do so many different things and i really do enjoy all of them I love bass drum for whatever reason, just getting a nice big full sound. I love cymbals, crashing those cymbals. Uh, I love snare drum. I love mallets. I love the accessories, tambourine, triangle, etc. I mean, that's also a part of the joy of being principal. You get to pick which one, which parts you get to play. <laughs> Um, and then in LA, we have such great players in the orchestra, in the percussion section that, you know, I can pretty much assign parts and everyone, every instrument is strong for them. So it's not like it's a weakness, but uh, it can come down to a particular piece, what you feel like playing. And I, typically on Tchaikovsky 4, I hope you know that maybe. It's a famous cymbal, bass drum part. I usually play cymbals on that, but sometimes I'll play bass drum or triangle or whatever, you know, because the guys can get tired of playing the same parts over and over. So we can rotate and it's not a problem. So it's, it's good with percussion. We get to rotate and play, you know, various instruments. It keeps it interesting. Um, great question. Uh, can I ask before we go on the person that asked that question, what's your favorite? My favorite? Oh. Uh, and why? And why? I kind of like bongos. I'm not going to lie. It's weird, but I do. Because you can get many different sounds out of them. You can play with your hands or sticks. And it has, you know, it has a different sound. And, you know, of course, there's two. So, yeah, I don't know. I just like the variety that you can get out of it. And let me follow up. Let me, because you guys aren't asking a lot of questions. So let me ask you a question. What's your name? Uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Uh, what is your strong point, uh, your strong area on percussion, and what's your weak area? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, we're, we're all percussionists. We understand. It's okay. Okay. Um, strong area? I'm still trying to figure that out. What um, do you feel really comfortable playing? I like. Once an instrument. I know. <laughs> we all play. We all play. This is the same patience. Snare drum, bass drum, fun stuff like that. Those are mainly my strong suits. But and I, what? 
I like South Af African hand drums as well. Oh, great, great. And what would you say is your weakness? Which, which instrument? Like if you're assigned, you have to play this or work on this part, you're like, oh my gosh. Keyboards, any keyboard. Aha, uh -huh. so this is a leading question, but so <laughs> what do you end up practicing most? Um, keyboard, what I practice. <laughs> Very good. I mean, and the point is that I'm trying to make is you should not spend most of your time practicing what you're comfortable with. Thank you. With, <laughs> whether it's an whether it's an instrument or a rhythm or whatever, you should spend most of your practice time working on your weakness. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> so yeah, again, Brooklyn, I'm not trying to, you know, pinpoint you down and <laughs> but just an ex as an example, that's one thing how you can improve yourself. Really focus and do your self identity and realize what makes you not so comfortable and work on that so that you have the confidence in what you're doing, whether it's a snare drum roll, I hate my rolls, well then work on them. And therefore you'll get through that. You'll you'll be very well, you do very well in your snare drum rolls. It starts with you. So uh, that's that's a common thing I, I say to students is that whatever your weakness is, don't let it be your weakness anymore. Another question? I have a nice question for you. How do you get students to practice tambourine and triangle when they think those are not very important parts? <laughs> because we've all seen difficult tambourine and, and triangle parts, and they think yeah. it's the main thing to focus on. Right, right. I mean, the, the easy answer would be you give them difficult snare, uh, difficult tambourine and triangle parts to learn. That way, you know, to really perfect them, they have to spend a lot of time working on them. And I would say usually when they do that, they come to appreciate, you know, the, the technique that's involved. And, you know, I would say without a doubt, tambourine has thrown so many auditionees, candidates, and they relatively overlooked it. You know, they, typically you work on your snare drum, your mallets, etc. But you kind of overlook that tambourine or even the triangle part, and it's so exposed. It, it really shows a lot. So, um, you know, whether you can do a mock audition or a, a pop-up quiz with them playing the tambourine, and then they realize, oh my gosh, <laughs> I really need to work on this or not. Maybe they don't get it. That's unfortunate. But at least you put them in that position where, you know, they have to play, uh, whether it's Dvorak, Carnival, Overture, or the Bizet, uh, Carmen, you know, they have to play those more challenging parts and they realize, oh my gosh, this is going to take some practice. Um, let me ask someone else else or anyone can take this um i think one of the questions that uh, delena you had sent is how much do you practice how much should someone practice how many how many days a week how many hours in a day etc cetera, etc cetera. um does anyone want to give away what they do as a starting point or is that too private of a question to ask you guys I want to hear what they tell you. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 What's uh, your name? What's your name? Bradley. I'm sorry? Bradley. Bradley. Bradley? Okay. All right. Bradley, tell us. Um, so my thing is I don't practice as like much or like as hard as I should until like I really have to like before an audition. And I know that's not right. And I've gotten like better at practicing throughout the years and I've been practicing more. But it's still not probably the amount that I probably should. Or at least I don't practice the things I should. That's better way to say. Well, Bradley, uh, number one, it's very good that you're admitting that in front of all of us. That's great. <laughs> I compliment you for that. Number two, I would then say, uh, why not? Because you know it, you know you should be practicing and you kind of wait. That's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm good at questions. <laughs> yeah. 
So, you know, ideally you want to pace yourself. If you have uh, an audition in a month, you don't want to wait to the last week or the last couple of days. You want to start now. And every day, keep track of what you're doing. I recommend a practice log where you have the date, how many minutes you practice any one excerpt or whatever the piece is, and the metronome marking. And then the next time you practice, which hopefully is the next day, you start from there. Okay, let me start with the metronome at 120. That's where I finished yesterday. And let's see if I can go a little bit further, et cetera, et cetera. So that when it comes to the final week, you're not trying to get from 100 to 160 to wherever the metronome marking is. Because that puts a lot of stress on you and your body, and it's just not good. It's just like cramming for a test. Uh, it, it's, just, it's not as effective as just learning over time and having your muscles learn what to do. So, Bradley, how do you practice? When you're, when you're practicing, are you breaking it down? as in doing it slower, doing it at a comfortable dynamic, etc. Well, normally I'll find places that I either know or I think I'll have trouble with, and I'll play the bit if I can, and then I'll break that down even further, go like each note at a time, maybe check later, and then I slowly, I slowly um, play it faster, and I get it to the point where I can play it over and over again correctly, and then I add things to begin But bad thing though is I don't really practice with the metronome. I know that's bad, but unless you have perfect rhythm, do you have perfect rhythm? Absolutely. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, yeah, uh, that's the other thing to use a metronome. I, I know sometimes you'll swear that metronome is not accurate. It's, it's moving slower or fat. No, it's us, you know, and that's the thing. You really have to trust it. And another recommendation, let's say you're doing something at a quarter note equals 120. Uh, don't necessarily set it to quarter notes, set it to eighth notes or sixteenths. So you hear those inner beats as you're playing. It is very helpful to do that. Highly recommended. Use your metronome and do a subdivisions with the met metronome. Really helps a lot. Um, anyone else want to tell me what their practice routine is? Yeah, speak louder so you can hear. But sometimes I don't practice as much as I should, and I don't really use the metronome. Then what do you do? Do you do small parts or do you do the whole thing? I do the whole thing. Depends on what it is. Yeah, so, you know, again, how you practice really makes the difference. It's not, that's why with the original question of how many days, how much time, it really depends on how you practice. If you're taking the time and doing it so-called correctly, as in you're not practicing with mistakes, because when you're practicing with mistakes, you're, 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 you're learning to keep making those mistakes. So your practice should be very efficient in that you're going slow enough and you have a nice comfortable dynamic that you're playing the passage correctly. And then you want to repeat. Don't just play it once correctly. Maybe not even two or three times. Maybe a couple days. Keep the same metronome marking that allows you to play it correctly. And then do it a little bit faster on the third or fourth day. It takes a lot of patience. It really does, uh, but it makes a big difference. I mean, if you ask my colleagues, my former colleagues in the Philharmonic, I, I would say 99% of us learned that at a very young age. You're going you're gonna to get the most out of your practice time by practicing correctly, practicing slowly, and gradually building it up. And I think that's in part how we got to be successful on our instruments. We did it that way and it worked. It doesn't work for absolutely everyone, but for most of us, that's a very good way to, to learn your instrument. And I often ask students um, 
who's your best friend? You know, and maybe they'll say Tom or Mary or I say, no, no, it's not good. If you're studying to be a performance major, your instruments should be your best friend because you need to spend that much time and get to know your instrument so well that you bond with that instrument and you know all the different per peculiarities of the instrument and you can produce all these different sounds because like your best friend, you spent so much time together. So it comes down to how much time and the quality time you spend with that instrument. And that is a difficulty with percussion because we have so many to master. But to me, that's also the joy. You know, where do you start? What instrument do you start on? What would be the, the number one instrument if you got a beginner to teach to start them on? Uh, yes. Was that bongos? Yeah. Or like one bongo. <laughs> Why not? Because you can literally just use your hands. No, don't, don't teach them how to hold a stick. Just teach them how to hit it right. I, I've never heard that approach before, but I, that's, I say that's possible. <laughs> what would be the second choice? <laughs> snare. Yeah, I, I think snare would probably go over bongos, but you know, I've never tried starting a student on bongos. I'll have to try that. But the, the point is to start with snare because it is our hands and our hands we use it in 99% of what we do on percussion, at least orchestral percussion. The better coordinated, the better dexterity you have with your hands, the better start you're going to have when you have to transfer to mallets, marimba, etc., timpani, etc., you know. So start with, your, with the snare drum, and if you just have a little bit of time to warm up, I would pull out a pad and get out my snare drum sticks and spend five minutes just doing my my warm-up exercise which is like a, a George Lawrence Stone accents and rebounds or stick control book anything like that just do that and get your hands in coordination and build them up over time that's the best thing you can do after your you know your hands get somewhat coordinated then it's great to go to marimba and actually start reading music that's a good thing too because it's very important to do that and then along the line it's great to have pitch recognition as that's what you'll need on timpani so you don't need timpani for that but you can just play a note whether it's on the marimba or on, a, or, or on the piano and sing it back make sure you're singing the exact same note and that's the first step to playing timpani i always say you can have the smoothest roll on timpani you can have the best touch but if you don't have the ear it's not going to work so you need to start with pitch recognition and knowing the intervals be able to sing and know all the intervals by heart. Uh, very important. And a, a question? Well, either I'm really covering it all or... <laughs> You're doing a great job. Okay. <laughs> you got to have more... Got to have more... Qu Sorry. Like, like I said to you earlier that they can hear it from someone, but then they need to hear it that that is really true. Yeah, you know? yeah. And well, I'll share the same thing with you, Delena. Same thing with my students. Um, typically, you know, sometimes I'll mention things and they'll do it. But sometimes when they hear it from someone else, they go, oh, okay, wow, okay. It's like I hadn't told them that before, but that's okay. Uh, let's see. Do all of you, or who plays drum set here? Put your hand up if you play drum set. Oh, great. Most of you do. I, I think it's a great thing. Uh, even if you want to be, I uh, say even, if you want to play, let's say, symphonic music, orchestral, believe it or not, but there's plenty of drum set in orchestras too, you know. So I think it's best to be versatile. You don't have to be the most amazing drum set player, especially if you're going to play it in orchestra. But you do need the fundamentals. You need to know how to play different styles of rhythm, you know, on the drum set. So I highly recommend that along with hand percussion, which is not, you know, what you typically have on an audition list, but it's good to know how to play 
congas, keep a beat, bongos, as uh, the young man suggested, starting someone on bongos. I, I don't have a problem with that, but you do need to know those two. So as well versed as you can be on percussion is a good thing. Do you need to focus? Do you need to specialize? You know, I would say the younger you are, no. You want to get a good idea of all the instruments. And as you progress, as you get older, perhaps college, university, then you can start thinking about, but you don't want to take, you don't want to turn down any gigs or turn down an audition because, you know, I don't think that's my specialty. I don't, you know, I've, I've seen and heard of many auditions where someone will play, let's say, an assistant timpani section percussion audition thinking that, oh, I have no way I'm going to get this. I'm really a timpanist or I'm really a percussionist. And they get this type of a gig or vice versa. Someone that's really studied percussion and really uh, done a little bit on timpani. But I, I see them win timpani jobs because you never know. And that's a good thing. And before you do these auditions, when you're just gigging, let's say, around town and you get a call and said, uh, contractor says, I've heard you play snare drum. You're an excellent snare drum player. I was wondering if you might be able to play kungas on this gig. I have coming up. Number one, you have you should say yes, even if you've never touched a conga before. And then what you do after that, after you hang up the phone, is you call Delaney and you say, I need help. <laughs> I need to learn right away how to how to fake it on congas. But that's how one way you get started, you know, and you'll have a couple of weeks maybe to learn some of the basics. So I'm glad to hear most of you play drum set. That's a very good thing. Um, any specialties there? Anyone say they specialize in one area at this point or not? Or you're all just learning it all? Oh, um, I'm diversification. I'm learning it all pretty much. That's what I've done. I'm not really focusing on one thing in general. I focused on snare drum like through middle school, but like going to high school, I learned to be more diverse with my selection. So that was a transition. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think another issue. Well, let me ask before I mention the issue of instruments and ac accessing them. Is uh, what? Uh, you tell me, Delena, what's the best way? Should I ask what grades we have or what ages? Grades. Okay. What grades is everybody in? Can you kind of just go down the line? Uh, oh, 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 I'm 16. Um, in 12, and I'm 17. Um, I'm 13. Okay. 6 and 11. Very good. We have a diverse group so, oh. we have one up here in the front so i'm in seventh grade and i'm 68. <laughs> <laughs> more power to you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, to be a percussionist and, and here at fim the new horizon band is no audition necessary so i started kind of behind everybody else and um, I, I'm slowly catching up. Um, the biggest thing I've learned this year was uh, about reading and not getting lost during the time changes and repeats. And so I'm having a lot of fun. And I've been doing three bands: Flint Concert Band. And I've been going to school at Mott, doing Mott Band, and then here at FIM, the New Horizon Band. So I'm catching up quick. That is fantastic, and I think the key word is fun he's having fun that's what we want to do you know and that's what i was blessed to do is to find you know i don't, I don't want to call it a job but it, it was a job with the la phil and i just had fun doing that can you imagine you know touring around the world playing the drums you know it's like we faked them out they really thought we should be doing something else but that's what we did and that's what we do so have fun so what i was going to ask about uh assess accessibility with instruments as most of you are middle school high school um it's obviously difficult to have a set of timpani at home 
to have a five octave marimba at home. So what you obviously do is you make use of the facilities at school. And that's common, that's what we have to do. But everybody absolutely has to have a practice pad at home. Who does not have a practice pad at home? Oh my gosh, is it possible? There's two of you. And okay, so. We have drums though at our house. So they, they've got a snare drum, they've got a drum set, they've got, yeah. No, not good enough, not good enough. You're, if you haven't already, uh, you know, scared your parents or your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, I mean, plus your own ears, because you're all young, you should start now by wearing earplugs on occasion, not all the time. But when you're doing some of the warm up things on a snare drum, it doesn't have to be on a snare drum. I would use a practice pad for that just to get your hands going and the technical stuff. When you're playing repertoire, etudes, whatever, you know, it's great to do that on the snare drum. But to start off, I would say you should have a practice pad and it'll save you time, it'll save your ears in the long run too. So that's a good thing. So uh, you gotta have a practice pad and it's very difficult to have a mallet instrument at home. If at best, maybe you have one of those little glockenspiels that, you know, is portable. That's better than nothing, you know. But then, you know, you have to make time at school where you have that one-on-one -on -one time with the mallet instrument, you know, whether it's a marimba, a xylophone, vibraphone, whatever. It's very, very important. Hands up for those that intend to going to a university, a college, whatever. All right. And, and actually, I should then ask majoring in percussion. Yes? Perhaps. Okay, you're all you're all gonna go to college, but you're not sure if you're gonna major in percussion at this point. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, what I was gonna say, if you're gonna major in percussion, you're gonna you're gonna probably need to do an audition uh, for the music school, um, and you're gonna have to play snare drum, concert snare drum. In other words, if you've got a drum set snare drum at home and practicing on that. That's okay, it's not great though. Concert snare drum is so different, it's so dry, and you hear every single thing you play very <laughs> cleanly. So it makes a big difference. Uh, you're gonna have to play mallets, whether it's a marimba or whatever. So you gotta have access, and then you're gonna have to play timpani. Um, so again, you're gonna have, have to have access, probably at school, to practice and build up your audition for for the college um, or university um, program. So you wanna prepare now. So if you're a senior, it's not, well, you're graduating now, I assume. But if you're a senior and next year, you've probably already put in applications, but you wanna send in applications to several schools so that you have an option and then you do your auditions, definitely get with Delena or whoever your private teacher is to prepare your auditions. Do not try to do this on your own. It's such an important thing. It's such an important step. You need the guidance. There's certain things that your teacher can mention, guide you with, lead you with that you would not know on your own. So it's such an important step from going from high school to your next uh, college, university, or uh, uh, conservatory if you're really serious about music performance and it's a very important thing. Also get help making, uh, filling out the application and filling out the possible scholarship form. Make sure you put down the right information because believe me, it can make a big difference. Um, but anyway, talking about instruments, again, you have to have access to a drum, whether it's your pad or a snare drum, and then you make the use of what you have at school at the Institute. Uh, with the mallet instruments and the timpani. Just to give you an example, for me, uh, going from my junior to senior year in high school, I asked the band director finishing the junior year that if, I asked if I could bring the timpani home through the summer. And I had, didn't ask my parents, I just asked the band director. He said, yeah, sure, we're just gonna be sitting here. So I had a buddy who had a pickup truck, pickup five, not four. So I included the piccolo drum, brought them all home over the summer. And let me tell you, in all honesty, it made such a huge difference to have an instrument I could play like that every day, as opposed to once in a while at school. So I say that to let you know that, you know, whether it's a marimba, 
that you can practice on every day, every any which way or timpani, whatever. It makes or it can make a big difference, you know. So, you know, you, you're not expected to have to have these instruments at home, but if you can access them, whether it's through school, boys club, boys club, girls club, etc., whatever, uh, it's going to make a big difference, and it could be a turning point for you. It was for me. You know, it was a very important thing that I I decided to do, and my parents were fine with it. I mean. I had five timpan in the living room, which is pretty amazing looking back at it now. But they were cool. They were cool with that. So any questions from this so far? I was just going to ask you, what did your parents think of you bringing the timpan in? They, they didn't think, think twice about it. You know, I think, number one, I was the youngest. So they'd been through a lot of this before with, I have two older brothers and two older sisters. None of them are professional musicians, but my middle brother played electric guitar, still does. So they, they kind of went through all this, taking them to rehearsals, play with band and, and this and whatever. And like, okay, Rainer wants to bring home five drums. Go ahead, whatever. You know. So I was very fortunate with that. Yeah, yeah. To have the support of what you're doing means a lot. Number one, from your parents, and then number two, from your your, your private teacher and your, your directors at school, it makes a big difference. But it starts with you. You have to show the initiative. You have to show the interest. You have to let that passion, if it is in you, you let it develop. And when I was young, I listened to classical music a lot. I went to concerts, I involved myself, I played in whatever ensembles I could, and it made a difference for me. So if that's what you want to do, I recommend you do that. If you want to teach, which is fantastic, start teaching now. You can find elementary school students that would love to spend 30 minutes with you because you're someone they look up to. You know, whatever you want to do, start doing it now and volunteer your time and it makes a big difference. You never know who you're going to touch by doing that. What else we got? What other areas to cover? How, how do you approach the different techniques for band, orchestra, and marching bands? Because I, I think it's hard because I think all these guys are doing marching band, they're doing orchestra, they're doing concert band, and it's very difficult. And I think they just think you just keep doing it all the same, and it's not. Yeah, it's it's not. And, you know, that's not my specialty, but I can see where things get, things need to be divided a bit. You know, I, I, I would say, for example, you don't crash the cymbals the same in an orchestra as you do on the field in marching band. Um, you know, you have to realize what you're doing in marching band. It's much more of a visual thing. I mean, it's a sound is important too, but uh, uh, it's just different, you know, that's why in marching band you do a lot more left, right, alternating things. In classical percussion, we use our strong hand a lot. If we need to use the other hand, okay, we use it. But usually you want to do a lot of things with your strong hand lead. But that's not the way it is in marching band. And you just, you want to realize and learn what these differences are and study them work with it you know uh marching band the history goes back to you know four five six hundred years ago when there was the the uh drum and bugle it wasn't called that um guilds where they had these clubs and where they had this special initiation etc cetera, etc cetera, and the drums the timpani were on the horses etc and they were played this way and that and but everything was very visual in, in, in addition to the sound, very strong and use very hard sticks, whether it was a bone or a stick, a uh, stick from a trumpet, uh, sorry, branch of a tree, etc. It was very crude, but that's the the way that the drum and bugle corps basically got its start. And then the composers started to put the trumpets and the timpani in the orchestra. And then it got refined, more or less, where it wasn't quite as flashy, but that's the origin of it. So it's good to know some of the history there. So um, how to define that and how to clarify that in your playing. Just remember what you're doing in the jazz band. 
you know, you're playing a certain thing. You are the leader of the rhythm section. So you keep that in mind. In an orchestra, you have to blend in a little bit more in general. So they don't think of us in the same way as the drummer in a jazz band. So you have to keep in context what you're doing and with, with, with which ensemble. Very good question, though. Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> I just, so, so is there a uh, such thing as overplaying when practicing? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So like, what point would that be? I mean, the easy thing the answer would be or you start to feel something in your hand, your wrist, your arm, or whether you feel tightness or after you play, you know, you notice something is sore. So you have to be careful, you know, that's why I say it's how you practice, not how long you practice, because it's better actually if you do slightly shorter sessions and take whether it's a 20, 30 minute break or an hour or two break and then come back in the evening and practice. It's better for your body that you're not practicing three or four hours straight. That's probably not so good. Although with percussion, I can say you can do an hour on, on snare and then take a 10 minute break, do an hour on timpani, take a 15 minute break, do an hour on mallets. Probably not so bad, but to do three hours on snare drum or timpani or any one, <laughs> or the worst would probably do three hours of crash cymbals. You don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah. Be aware of what your body is telling you. That's what our nerves and our body are for. They let us know something's hurting for a reason. You're overdoing this, that, or the other. So be very conscious and aware of that. Very good thing. Great question. When you're looking to get a new pair of like sticks or mallets, is there anything in specific you're looking for that you, like, you always Um was the question what to look for in a new pair of sticks or mallets? Yeah, well, it, they, if you already have, you know, a set, several sets of marimba mallets and you're looking to get a new pair, obviously, I, well, I, not obviously, but I would say they would be complementary to what you already have. I mean, the easy thing is if you have a pair of medium, you have a, a pair of hard, you want to get something that's on the soft side that would complement what you already have. Um, and typically when you're getting mallets as in marimba, xylophone, glockenspiel, I recommend, it's not the most affordable thing to do, but I recommend you get two pairs, in other words, four mallets at once. That way, if you, if you have a pair and then you need another pair and you've had one pair for six months and you get a brand new pair, they're not going to sound the same. But if you get two pairs right away, they probably will be more or less identical. It's not as much on Xylo and Glock, but definitely on the yarn um, cord covered vibraphone marimba mallets. If you can afford it, buy two pairs at one, at one time instead of uh, one pair and then buy another pair of the same mallet like a year later. Um, but I hope that answered your question. You want to get something that complements. What do you start with? Well, I would say something in the middle of the road. If you can only afford to buy one pair of timpani mallets, what would they be? Medium. That's easy. You know, same thing for marimba, et cetera. Get something in the middle that covers just a general range. And then your next pair can be slightly harder, slightly softer. Then your next pair, et cetera, et cetera, can be different from that, you know. Um, one thing you will maybe be surprised, I don't know, professional percussionists have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pairs of mallets. And my wife lets me know that just about every day. <laughs> what are you doing with all these? Well, you know, we need a lot of variety because there is no one magic pair of timpani mallets. There's no one magic that covers everything. If you play diverse music, as in, let's say, an orchestra, you play from Bach, Baroque, to the present day, you're going to need a variety of all mallets on all the instruments. It's just that's what the music calls for. Delena, I think you had a question. Um, well, it's two. When timpani mallets, bamboo handles, or wooden handles? Or it's, it's, it, it's, it's a... It, it's a personal thing. It's not a, a one or the other. It's what feels good for you. 
Uh, I do what I learned from my teacher, and it's not, for him, Mitch Peters, and the same for me, no one manufacturer covers it all. They do, as far as covering it from wood to really soft. But like you, like you were asking, I, sometimes I like the feel of the bamboo. Sometimes I like the feel of uh, whether it's a, like, I don't know if you know the hanger style aluminum uh, shaft. I like that. Yeah, it just depends on what I'm playing. So uh, that might be different. I, I know most professional timpanists make their own mallets. But I think if you ask them, then if they're honest, they'll tell you that they probably use a variety also. Maybe not as big a variety because they make pretty much exactly what they need. But um, for me, variety is, is the key, is the key to what we do. Does that hold true for you with like bell mallets and xylophone mallets and marimba mallets? Because you've got bamboo, you've got wood, you've got a five yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the handle for me, uh, for the mallet instruments, I prefer rattan, you know, but that, that's a personal choice. Some people prefer the birch. I, I just like that flexibility of the rattan. I like the way it moves. It just feels not as stiff. Plus, uh, we did a we did a premiere of a John Adams. It's been a few years now, but I think it was City Noir. I don't know if you know that piece. It's got a famous vibraphone part on it now that's making the auditions very difficult. I had the pleasure or displeasure of having of premiering it, so I was the first to learn it. But it, and it took probably a good month for me to learn that part. So the point with the mallet is because I was playing vibraphone every day, at least three, maybe four hours. I could not use a hard shaft on that. Otherwise, my wrists would start hurting because you're hitting metal, metal, metal all the time. Whereas, you know, on the marimba, it's more forgiving because it's wood. So you have to keep that in mind, too. Um, but that, for me, is why I like the rattan. It gives a little bit. It's not quite as percussive and hard on my wrists. But very good question. You know, for snare drum, you want to have a good general pair of sticks that you use 90% of the time. And I like to have an, a, a contrasting pair that has a very small bead. That way, when I play very small, soft passages like Bolero, uh, Scheherazade, the soft passages, Lieutenant Kije, I use that mallet. It just makes it easier to play soft. I don't have to have those, but I like them. And then the same thing is when we do, uh, or when we did, uh, very loud percussive uh, or military sounding snare drum parts, I'd use a heavier stick, more of a marching stick, uh, because to me it fit the sound. Very heavy, very dark. I didn't even have to force it. I, it, it just played so loud because it was so big. And I like to use a different drum too. Um, some things where it just says snare drum, I, I get creative. Like in Scheherazade, I use at least two, maybe a piccolo for the soft things, and then maybe a five, five and a half for the other louder passages. Shostakovich is famous for me for I've had three, four drums on stage. One field drum for a very loud militaristic type sound and a piccolo for the soft, delicate things, etc., etc. That's the benefit of being in an orchestra where whether they have the instruments or I can afford to buy several. I know a lot of times in school you use what the school has, but maybe keep this in your head to think when you're playing, is this instrument going to fit that passage best? And what's going to determine that? Well, listen to recordings. Listen to what you hear in recordings and kind of get an idea of the sound that you have in mind. And that's what rehearsals are for. Try them out in rehearsal. Try a deep drum. Try a shallow drum. Try a large pair of cymbals. Try a small pair, you know, etc. I like to use slightly bigger cymbals than I would say most people. I hardly ever use 18s. I use 20s and 22s most of the time because I felt like if I just crash the cymbals and they're larger, I let them work on their own. I feel like when I use a smaller pair, I have to overplay that pair to get a big sound. So... That's me. Any any general questions on instruments relating to that? Playing when you're playing in an orchestra or whatever, and you have selected the mallets and the instruments that you like, and you're in rehearsal, 
and the conductor says, I don't like that sound. What do you do? I run off the stage. <laughs> but it, it happens. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, it that's that's really easy, that's really simple, you know. It's maestro what what would you like? What did you have in mind? If quite often they don't know, they'll just say, you know, I the sound is the, I just have a different concept and they are the boss. You you do whatever within reason, you know, need to do to please them. Whether it's a bigger pair of cymbals, a harder stick, a softer stick, uh, muffle the drum here or don't muffle, etc. You know, they, they that's why they're on the podium and we are not. And, you know, you can also reverse that. You you basically want respect from what we do because we, you know, we are professionals. And I would say 99 times out of 100, they do. There's always that one, that conductor that might say something that they have no idea. <laughs> but anyway, outside of that, you know, they respect what we do. They will politely ask in a certain way, you know, is there a different way to get, can we get a more staccato sound? Then I know what to do. But always it's my job to please the conductor. You know, if they, and then, like I say, they're usually very nice, but if they say, you know, I like a different sound here. Oh, what, what did you have in mind? It's always a good conversation. Or I can meet him at him or her at the break and, you know, talk about it more specifically. Yes, sir. What is your favorite movie you've ever played in? Was that, what is the favorite movie I've ever played in? No, group. Favorite group? Well, I, that, that would be the Los Angeles Philharmonic. That's, that was a very easy one. Is that is that not the answer you expected or? No, it's fine. Okay, I, I think I let you down, but <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I see a question in the back. What got you interested? What got you interested in music? Oh well, my parents just having music around the house. Um, like I said earlier, uh, I just grew up with all styles of music and it was just in me. And uh, I often say I didn't choose the drums, the drums chose, chose me. There's just rhythm. I just am fascinated by rhythm and love the sound of playing different rhythms in that. So it, it was just natural for me. Yeah. What, what, what has gotten you interested in music and percussion, may I ask? Couldn't quite hear the last thing you said. The more you learn about it, the more fun it becomes. Great, great. Glad to hear that. Yeah, it's it's such a fun thing to do. You know, whether you're a professional or you, you plan on being a lifelong student, whatever, it's just Music is, is great and it, it, it balances out your life. It's so important. I cannot imagine a world without music. It's just not possible. It, the, the world would collapse if we had no music. We have to have music. You, know. you got some more questions? So uh, when he was asking what was your favorite group and you said, what was your favorite movie? Have you ever played <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe you didn't catch it when I was going over, you know, what I've done, whatever. Yeah, I played on several movie soundtracks over the years. Um, you know, I, I always say I, I would have played on more, but I had a job. So <laughs> often they would call and ask me to play, but I, I, I can't get out of the orchestra to play on a soundtrack, typically. So I didn't do that many. But uh, the last one I did was a lot of fun. That's been a few years now, I guess about three years ago, the newest the version of The Lion King. That was a lot of fun because I guess there's so much rhythm coming from Africa and it was uh, recreated in the score. Um, and it was just a lot of fun doing that. And that, that actually 
because there was so much music in that music in that movie it took actually two weeks to do that which is a long time to do uh one movie typically uh maybe a week or four days for uh your typical soundtrack and this actually took two weeks there's a lot of percussion in that so anybody see the movie lion king the recent one not the old one great so you probably heard me playing in there that was fun are there any other movies you play? Yeah, yeah, I mean, quite a few. I, they just kind of fall by the wayside because that's not the main thing I do. I've done a lot of the uh, Spike Lee movies, Black Klansman, um, Miracle at St. Anne. I mean, uh, the Marish Jar, who was a composer that has passed away. I did a lot of his movies before he passed away. Dead Poet Society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's fun, but it, it's different. It's not as uh, active because there will be they'll record one cue, which may be two minutes of music at a time, and they'll spend maybe 30, 40 minutes on that one cue. So there's not a lot typically happening, but you know, it's good. It's fun. It's a different, very different thing from playing live in the orchestra because this is all recorded. So it's not necessarily about the exact sound you hear because it's on a microphone and the engineer turns things up and turns things down as needed so it's good it's it's a it's an interesting thing to learn how to do too so uh i guess the next question would be do you prefer playing in movies or in a live orchestra a uh, live orchestra yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh you know it's pretty hard now not to put down any of the movie composers but it's pretty hard to beat you know the Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky. It's hard to get better than those. Although I would say John Williams gets close, you know. I've done many scores with him and he's conducted actually more, even more so, he's conducted the Philharmonic many times. And he's just a joy to work with. Amazing man and obviously one of our best, if not the best uh, Hollywood studio composer that we've had, so. Could you tell us a little bit about ABOP? ABOP. That's the Alliance of Black Orchestra Percussionists. Uh, that's something that I started along with six other colleagues across the country. And we got together, we did Zooms like this, and we decided to start a mentorship program to uh, direct, guide black orchestra percussionists that wanted to pursue a career in orchestral percussion. and the the main impetus is that there aren't many of us and we believe there should be more and uh, myself and the six other guys we like what what can we do well we can actually mentor and help teach also so that's one of my main focuses these days like i say it's not as much playing but it's more administration and teaching which i i love to do i love when i find a student that kind of recreates what i was like when I was 15 or 16, I see that passion. I see that whatever I give them the practice, they're ready for more. It's, it's so encouraging with that. So that's what I'm doing a lot, uh, a lot with. Uh, if you're interested in looking that up, uh, we have a website, and that's www.abopabop.us. So I encourage any of you to go on there, and you can learn more about that. But thank you for asking, Delena. I just I think it's a really important thing that we need to have for all, Thank you. all these issues. You've got yeah. Sleeps, yeah. You might as well have a bot, right? Yeah, you know, that's the thing. Um, and if you don't know this, maybe you'll come to know is that percussion is not often included in programs and whatever, or we're at the bottom. And I think if it's up to us to stand up and say we deserve this, that, and the other also. Uh, because there's many programs in, in schools and universities and conservatories that deal with, you know, strings and wind programs. And there's some for percussion, but it's not, we're not given our due. Whether it's in the resources, having enough instruments, whether it's having enough practice rooms, whether it's having enough opportunities to play, whatever. It's not the same as the strings. I think strings get... And, and they should get a nod in a certain way because in an orchestra, string players are playing probably 80 to 90% of the time. Whereas, you know, percussion, let's be honest, sometimes we're just sitting down. 
thinking about what are we having for lunch today, you know. But on the other hand, you know, we deserve to have special programs for us because we need it. Percussion has risen to such a high level because of us, because of Delena, because of other teachers, because of us putting the effort, because of the Percussive Arts Society, which I hope you all know of and know about that. Uh, it's to our benefit to uh, ensure our future by helping others out with that. Like I said earlier, definitely if you can reach out and help teach younger students that you know would love to know more about percussion and would love to have your old pair of snare drum sticks maybe they have nothing or your old pair of marimba mallets so whatever we can do to share and to have fun at what we do i think it makes a big difference well i think it's about time to close our session i would really like to say thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Has the loudest clap you've ever heard. <laughs> yes, that's I had good. Hand clapping in the youth symphony concert, and it was like that's all you could hear was him clapping. Uh, but so we just we got to get you here in Michigan sometime. I'd love to. I'd yes. love to. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, you guys have been fantastic. Maybe a few more questions would be good, but I don't know. <laughs> no, but you know, if you do have any other questions, you can give them to Delaine and she'll pass them on to me. But uh, yes, I'd love to come out someday, do a, a, a session or two and actually play. I still do play, believe it or not. I know how to play still. So I'd love to come out and show you a few things from, from what I do. And African drumming, it's so fun. It's so fun to do that. You just have to be careful with your hands. You can't do a lot of African drumming and then go play Scheherazade on the snare drum. It doesn't work. It's very difficult to do that. So, But thank you all, and I wish thank you, you so success. Thank you. See ya. Okay. Wait, Derek, don't shut it up. Look at that. Doesn't it look impressive? This room it just looks It really makes cool. it look like a big ballroom. Yes, it looks like a ballroom <laughs> castle or something. It does. Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because we, we see that all the time. Yeah. When we go to our room, maybe. Huh? It does. Yes. It's, well, it's very cool. Very cool. Uh, this was recorded. If anybody wants to get a copy of it, you can email it to me uh, at the office, and we can give you a copy of that video. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for running it. This yeah. is Dare, by the way. Yeah. Oh. And his name is Dare, so get it right, guys. It's not Dar, <laughs> it's not 